You're listening to the RFP Success Show with eight-time author, speaker, and CEO of the RFP Success Company, Lisa Verhurek. Tune in each episode to learn what today's Capture and RFP teams are doing to increase their win percentages by up to 20, 30, and even 50%, and meet the industry trailblazers that are getting it right. Let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the RFP Success Show. I am your host, Lisa Rehurek founder and CEO of the RFP Success Company. So I'd like to introduce you to our guest for today's episode. His name is Charles Fred, and we're going to be talking all about defining and targeting your high value customer. So Charles, welcome to the call. Lisa, thanks for having me. One of my favorite topics and with one of my favorite people. So how fun is that? I'm excited to do this with you today. Yeah, this is going to be a really great conversation. So let me tell you all a little bit about Charles. I'm going to give you the formal stuff and then a little more informal stuff. But Charles Fred is an entrepreneur. Well, first of all, he's CEO of a company called True Space. So he's an entrepreneur and researcher best known for a body of work that positively influences the success of small businesses. He has inspired a movement to help entrepreneurs create conditions for sustainable growth. And through this effort to stimulate thousands of new jobs, Over his nearly 40-year career, Charles has founded and led three companies into the middle market, generating over $220 million in enterprise value. So it's super impressive, everything that he's done. But the reason that I wanted to have Charles on is I know Charles really well. We are actually, my company is actually part of True Space, and Charles personally mentors me, and he's just brilliant. And everything that we do in our businesses and certainly around proposals, I don't care if you are a small business, a medium business, a large corporation, it really stems from knowing who we are and who our client is, who our high value client is. So I thought this was a really timely and great conversation for us to have. So again, Charles, welcome. And I'm going to jump right in to the first question, which is, you know, really this, your company, True Space is the coaching company, and it's unlike anything that's come before it, unlike anything that I've ever seen. So tell us a little bit about what it makes it unique and talk a little bit more about this high value clients. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'm still trying to get over the 40 year thing that in my introduction, but thank you for that. Now, if anybody wants to do the quick math, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the late fifties, early sixties were the beginning of my life in this earth. Thanks again for having me, first of all. I think you're the people listening to us today, there are some nuggets that we can share mostly from depth of research. So I'm not coming to you or your audience today with a bunch of opinions. I'm much more of a journalist and researcher. And I have a body of, of work that I think is kind of interesting. True Space, the firm that you talked about, is the space between businesses in the United States that have between 1 million and 10 million in revenues. We call it true space because in that zone, there's 2.1 million businesses that operate there. And if those businesses were able to reach the middle markets, the middle markets start at 10 million. If just 10% of them would reach that, there's 17 million net new jobs there. My mission on life is to help people like you grow and create more jobs. I believe deeply, Lisa, that the thing that we do as entrepreneurs is create the conditions for people to develop their lives and their careers by offering them work. And there's no better place to work in the world than in a business the size of yours today, in my opinion. So can I just interject there real quick? Because, you know, it's it's important to know, I started working with Charles probably about two years ago now, and we were at, you know, two and a half employees that included me. We are now at nine employees. So proof already that what he speaks of is, I mean, I'm proof of that, right? Helping grow. So it's it's an important conversation. Yeah. And the key for a business like yours too, Lisa, is you might employ directly nine employees, but the number of suppliers and and support systems that you have that you support are probably 30 to 50 people today across the country. So there is an ecosystem that's created by the wake effect of businesses like yours that are expanding and growing. So I guess what makes us maybe unique as a firm is that we teamed up with the Gallup organization, the preeminent research firm worldwide that looks at the workplace. And we tried to find out why more firms weren't going from a million to 2 million to 10 million. Why are so many somewhat stuck or or at least fixed in a position below the the middle markets? And the research that we have now is in its 10th year, we spent almost $15 million to look at at, at, at really the data behind that. And in our discussion today, that's what I really wanna try to share some of those nuggets that we drove out of there. 
So not the least of which, Lisa, is I got to diagnose your business with a tool that's a psychometric tool that that predicts performance. Um, it's a predictive tool of which you are now with our last assessment of that. You've placed your position, your business in a position to be in the top 3% of companies nationally for continuous growth. And that's what we can we can measure. And you've pulled that from, you were basically in the top 60% and you pulled it that far in the last couple of years. So I'm really proud of you for doing that. Thank you. It's, it it's obviously wouldn't have, have been able to do it without you, but. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I wouldn't take the credit for that because I think you've had to make all the hard decisions to get there, but it's uh, by being in that, by moving there, what it means is that you have a much higher chance a 97% chance of continuous growth next year. Wow. That's what our model can predict. So you still got to do the hard work. You still got to yeah. make the tough decisions. You still got to do all those crazy things that we as entrepreneurs do. But anyway, that's that's a little bit of what we do. Uh, lastly, is that we can see 12 systems in your business with data. And you know that. There's 11 systems in the human body, your nervous system, your endocrine system, your digestive system. And there's 12 systems in a business. And one of which I want to talk to you, that we're going to talk about today is the alignment condition, but the system of focus, which includes the high value customer. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today, I think. Yeah. You know, it's a really exciting conversation that I want to have because we continue to have that conversation, you and I, about my business and really honing in on that high value customer. And intellectually, I know the importance of it. We preach it to our clients all the time, but it's a hard thing as a business owner to, to do. It's hard to figure out. And why I thought it was such an important conversation is because as we look at, you know, there's people listening to this podcast that are saying, hey, we want to break into state government. We are thinking about this. It's not been an area that we've jumped into yet. How do we even get into it? And it isn't by just bidding on anything that you can do, right? And, and for those of you that have been in the state government space already, I would guess that a good percentage of you out there are bidding on more than you should be bidding on. And it really does all start with understanding who your high value client is. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that. Like what is specifically, I mean, we can all make an intelligent guess on what this means, but talk to us a little bit deeper about what is a high value customer, high value target. Yeah. So the system we would diagnose that has the high value customer, high value target in it the system is called focus. Um, we have a noun for every one of the systems that's in your company today. There are four elements in the focus system. Now I want you to think about why do we need to focus? Let's just, let's put that context out there first. We have to focus because we have a shortage of these three resources, time, talent, and capital. Every company in the world suffers from a shortage of those three resources. And if they're unfocused, especially in a business that's smaller, mid-sized businesses, you will dilute those three resources if you're shooting at everything that comes by, if you don't focus those three resources. But focus, to be able to do that, you have to take basically four elements in your business and really take a hard look at them. The first is market. And this isn't you know, the Silicon Valley nomenclature of product market fit. That just sounds so pretentious to begin with. It's actually finding a place where you can stand out. And paradoxically, focus in a market, the more you focus, the more you'll grow, um, especially for a business that's less than 100 million or 10,000 employees. The more you'll focus that business, the more you actually grow, the more you stand out. For example, Lisa, you recall this, but our data states that businesses that are growing consistently are winning 65 or greater percentage of their proposals. The ones that are stuck are winning 15 or less, 15% or less. And the mid-range between those is dramatic as well. But we want to get to a place where we stand out and can win. And this is so perfect for your business and what you're trying to do to help your customers. Because ultimately, you're trying to help me win. That is the reason you exist, is to make my win rate change. So market's number one. We got to choose the place. So if it's state, where in the state? Um, where are we going? What are we targeting? And where can we actually be much different or stand out compared to everybody else? That's number one. That's the first part of focus. But the second, once you do that, is you must pick a customer that helps you build your business. So let me describe that and let's have a little dialogue about it today because it is it is a bit of a controversy. I believe from the data that we have that there's only two types of customers in a service business. 
There's one that helps you build it, build your business. And there's one that ties you down. The one that helps you build your business actually sees the value. They see that you stand out. They love the people that you have in your organization. They want to be part of your, your vision and your mission and, and all those things. And they will not only pay your price because they see the value of your business, but they laud your business and they give you references, referrals, and so forth. They're there and we can choose them and they'll help you build your business. But the contrast of that is the other type of customer, the binary form of this is somebody who's always looking for a discount. They don't trust you. So they want to call every reference you have. They want you to do things that you normally don't do. They want it their way. They want a special way. These are the kind of customers from our data. For every email that you receive from a high value customer, you get four emails from a low value customer. They're high maintenance. They take a lot of work. They're hard on your people. And after you've done all those special things for them, Lisa, they leave you. That's the kind of customer that we call ties at town. They take our time. We take them because we need revenue, but they don't help us grow their business. So high value customers, number two, three is point of view, which is a strong point of view. Yours happens to be that you're going to help. You're going to put all your resources to help me have a better win rate. But then you have to have the talent that the high value customer lauds and enjoys. So that's the four parts of focus. But the most important part, once you chose a market, is picking the customer, the target market, or excuse me, the target customer. That's the most important step that you take. And by the way, it's the heart. It is, yeah. So there's so much to unpack in this. I want to first go back to one of the first things you said under number one is your market. It isn't just saying, well, we can work in the state of Arizona and do X, Y, and Z. Get a very specific piece of golden nugget in there, which is where you can stand out finding your market where you can stand out. And, you know, I'll tell you, we're all, every time we respond to an RFP, everybody listening to this, we're trying to find a way to differentiate ourselves. And if you do that piece of it, just number one of what you've talked about, you're already getting to a point of differentiation, right? And how beautiful is that? I love that point. And then, oh, when you were talking about then figuring out who your, who the person is or the company or, you know, the actual target It's both. Yes. It is amazing how many times we put up with those clients that really don't serve us. And we think that we have to, for whatever reason, and it is hard, right? As a business owner to turn people away, but how magical to say, and and actually we've, we're in discussion about this right now because I only want clients that are going to make my team happy, that my team is going to get excited to work on, and they should only want to work with a team that is excited to work with them, right? Instead of those depleting clients. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating. We don't know that they're a low value customer until we kind of get into the mix. Timing's everything when we put this together. But imagine, remember what I talked about on focus is that you have to focus so you don't dilute where you're spending your time, your capital, and your talent. Well, what our research will, will tell us, since I'm a reporter researcher here on this call today, is that you're going to spend anywhere from 75 or greater percent of your time on low value customers because they will demand it. They're going to complain. They're going to want it, you know, things done their way. They're just constantly taking time in addition to all the other things if you're a service business. Oddly enough, from our research, the high value customer blends in with your firm. They get to know you. Uh, you get to complete each other's sentences. They want to be part of the delivery because they see you as part of their value of the way they're putting you know their their process into the marketplace. So that's the difference. Now, over time what it takes us at least is we have to start getting rid of the low value customer to grow. I know that sounds really strange and it's very controversial and you know that a lot of our a lot of our information is somewhat controversial. This is one of them that you can only grow your business with those that want to help you grow. The other ones are just going to tie your business down. They take all your resources. So one of the ways to get there is you've got to start, you know, depleting the companies that are not going to help you, that are low margin, tough on your people. We looked at turnover. You know, we worked with Gallup on turnover, right? Very interesting nugget here, but people leave organizations like yours, not because of the traditional reasons they leave because they're wildly stressed out. Um, If you look at my book, the 24 hour rule, that research that's in there, that's the key reason people are leaving the business. Well, where do they get the stress? probably from a low value customer that was just banging their head against the wall every single day, asking for things that we don't do normally, putting sleepless nights into us. You can't build your business that way. So 
The alternative is make the hard decision, move to move to a higher value customer, find more high value customers, and your business starts to flourish. Well, it sounds easy in theory, right? But what do you say to the 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 leader or the business owner that's saying, ah, but I'm going to leave money on the table? And how how do they shift that mindset to go from you're, you're going to eventually get more money, but it might be a little clunky along the way? Yeah, it's it's a balance when you're building a business like yours in particular. Sometimes you got to grin and bear it. We need the revenues. We need to pay our bills and our people. All I'm saying is that you have to intentionally start moving toward a higher density of high value customers if you're going to get bigger. At the same time, the only way to grow any business, and when we're talking to your customers in particular, they got to where they are with, frankly, with some courage and courage to make these hard decisions. You'll see the benefit of it very quickly. And the other thing you've got to do, so let's go all the way back to how did we get in this situation in the first place? I think our incentive systems at the sales side drive low value customers. I want to, another controversial part of this is that commissioned salespeople with no boundaries will bring anything in the door because they're paid by the people coming through the door. They're not paid by the type of, of customer it is. So you've got to have, you've got to change or look hard at that when you're building your business because our reward systems develop the things that we have. Our businesses are perfectly designed to produce the results that we see. So if you're getting a high number of low value customers in the door, go back and look at the very essence of the way in which you're you're compensating the people, bring them, bring them to the table. So that's a great point. I love that point. And you know, what's interesting too, the something else that you said, it isn't just about, I, I think when we look at business school 101, or whatever we generally see when we're looking at target market and who our ideal client is, it's very demographic heavy, right? What industry are they in? What location are they in? But you talked about things that were a little bit more psychographic, right? Like, why do you think that that's so hard for companies? Do you think that they just don't know that they need to be doing that? But why do you think it's so hard for them to be focusing on those kinds of things too? Is it just too, what's the roadblock there? One of the roadblocks is the narrative across the country is, is rapid, fast growth. I think it's a concept and a theme that our research completely demystifies that the faster you grow or faster you attempt to grow, the less you learn. So we know that speed or hustle or whatever you want to call it is the enemy of predictability. And yet predictability is the only way to create a great business and build value. So what we get ourselves into, Lisa, is a hurry. Fast, quick, more. Just think about A lot of businesses that you and I work with, we make these mistakes ourselves. I've made them a thousand times, but we reward things that are episodic. We reward things that, you know, landed on our lap by chance. And when you do that, you end up building more and more low value customers because by, by their very nature, they're, they're dropping into your business, taking what they can because you set that in motion to go fast and fast is measured by revenues. So The thing that you know from working at TrueSpace is that the CEO's job is to create the capability to become predictable. And I know that sounds boring, but boring businesses are the best businesses out there. They're good places to work. They're highly valuable. You pay your bills well, um, and you create wealth. That's the concept. I think it's speed that actually gets us in trouble. You think about good old Ben Franklin, who wrote his uh, Poor Richard's Almanac as as, as a pseudonym. He was the original tweeter. So the almanac was was delivered to 10,000 people in the 13 colonies to all 10,000 people that could read 100% distribution. But all his little sayings in there and haste makes waste is one of his most famous, right? Tweets per se uh, from the 18th century. Anyway, fascinating stuff, right? Yeah. You know, it really is because again, if we go back to something that we preach all the time in our company to our clients is that, you know, stop bidding on everything. Yes. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And it's not about quantity. You know, people will say, well, we want to increase the quantity of the response, you know, the RFPs that we respond to. And it's like, it's not about quantity. It's about how it's about quantity of winning. And in order to win, you know, you, you can bid on 50 RFPs in a year and win 5% of them and kill your staff and burn everybody out, or you can be a lot more methodical and thoughtful about it. And, you know, I know you said boring, that predictability seems boring, but really at the end of the day, it's not because it becomes this scalable business that you can see grow and you can see employees, 
you know, you can see that you're hiring more employees and then there's more innovation that can come into play. I would bet that a company like Apple, which doesn't seem boring at all, is probably boring if you look at it from that perspective, right? Yeah, especially if you took Apple and you you distilled it down to its its components, uh, component parts, it's definitely a predictable business. Uh, yeah. The way in which they launch a product, by the way, is scientific. And so our businesses, of course, are not that big. We're, we're, a, we're a microcosm of those things. But on the topic of this whole thing around finding the right customers, let's go back to what you just said about flooding the place with RFPs and hoping that one hits. Imagine running a manufacturing process where you had 95% waste by the time you got a final product out. That's what that means. So with that much waste in a proposal process, I can guarantee you that you're not very sustainable as a business. So we have to be as much more accurate with where we're going to win, where we can stand out, the type of company we actually want to work with. And I know that you espouse this with your work with your customers because increasing the win rate is ultimately the reason you exist on the earth. Um, yep. So the more focused we can get, the more targeted we can get before we spend time, talent, and resources and capital on this, the better the business is going to be. And by the way, no matter what size you are, I look at some larger businesses in the space that you're supporting today, and they got there because they got boring fast. They didn't drive revenue quickly. They got boring quickly. They figured out where they're going to stand out, and they did so. The ones that are kind of in and out, you get to see these a lot that are flying in, throwing everything at the wall and saying, oh, that piece stuck over there. Let's go do more of that. They're not very sustainable because they don't know why it's stuck. They threw it all there and they don't know why it's stuck there. So they can't replicate it. And now if they're back at the same thing, throw more stuff at the wall. So I think in essence, you're trying to help people with that. Yeah. And it's fascinating when you say, when you, when you frame it the way you did, that it's like 95% waste, like, ow, that's kind of gut-wrenching if you think about it from that perspective. And many companies just think that that's okay because RFPs are, you know, a losing proposition. So many people have that mentality. So uh, I love that you brought that into play there because that is a different frame of reference with it. And 95% waste, nobody should be Yep. accepting that in their organization. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be back with Charles, Fred in just a couple of minutes. Is your company looking to break into state government contracting, but you don't know where to start? The RFP Success Company is here to help. From knowing who to target and where to find bids, to being prepared for that first bid that hits your desk, we're your go-to source. Learn more by scheduling a call with our experts at findrfpsuccess.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are talking to Charles Fred about high value clients and getting all sorts of great, wonderful insight on how important it is and the importance of focus and predictability in your business. And of course, as a business owner, this is something that's very close to my heart. But for all of you listening out there, this comes into play with RFPs, absolutely, because if you're bidding on anything that you can bid on, you're missing the point of focus and predictability. So we're having a really great conversation. So here's a question for you, Charles. Is companies high value target set for life? Like once you once you set it, that's it? Or does it change over the course of the lifetime of a business? I think it's constantly changing, actually. In fact, the the responsibility of high value is on our shoulders, not the customer's. We have to constantly be innovating and creating a condition and a relationship that is of high value. Now, the good news is if they were once there, they're often there, but things change. I'll give you an example of a number of uh, your potential constituents that might be selling to school districts, statewide, county districts. The superintendents change, I think, every three years nationally uh, across the country. So relationships at that level that change when you are contracting with a district or, or uh, you know, a school system, those are things that we have to get ready for as a business, because the dynamics of that is something that we need to go say, look, there was a high value relationship, high value customer that just walked out the door. How do we replace that? How do we prepare for it? So what we espouse with the data sets that we have, and you know this, Lisa, from your business, but we have you plan for that. We actually, it's in a playbook that plans for some level of relationship turnover in these high value relationships, because I haven't seen very many RFP projects today that are uh, two months in length. There's a few of them, but most of them are long-term. Yeah. If it's long-term, you've got to manage the relationship well through that process. 
especially if, if what we really want is some follow on business some follow on maintenance and support. So I don't think it's for life. In fact, I think a really poor operating assumption would be that everything's going to be fine forever. Now you can apply this to everything, marriages and all kinds of stuff. You got to keep working at it. And that's the data that we saw in our ethnographic work. Ethnographic, of course, is the anthropology side of our research, but these constantly change. Now, other things that change, by the way, that are within our control are our own team members. So one of the worst things that you want to do to a team that's a highly developed team is to pigeonhole great talent on one project, even because they quote in quotes, have the best relationship with the client. They can still have that, but they need to grow too. They need to grow in their careers and across your business if you're going to grow. So we have to keep that in mind too, based on your question of, you know, what's the life cycle of this look like? Because I've seen a lot of companies take somebody with your talent as an example, and you have a great relationship with me and you're stuck with me literally for four or five years and you haven't grown. That doesn't help either one of us just because we're connected. So So those are the things that are are within our control that I think can answer that question too. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we get into a comfort zone, right? This is comfortable. It's been working. So why change it? Now, for people that are listening that are like, okay, how do I either get started or take a step back and say, how do I, I this is a big question I'm going to ask you, but they maybe haven't defined the high value client yet, or they need to take a step back and say, okay, really, do we know who it is? Let's take a step back. Where do they start? Like what's something that they can get started doing? Yeah. So the businesses you and I work with have been in business for a while. So when you're in business, you have these things called patterns and I love them because we can, if you have, if you're curious and you have a data mindset, you can go look at the patterns of these customers. One of the first places that I look is actually in relationship. I look at the gross margin of the projects that we have and the lower gross margin projects. I can almost tell you today with data that they're also going to be the low value customer. They asked for discounts or we had to discount our project to get it started, which means they really didn't trust us. So we actually had to give them, throw them a bone, so to speak, to do this work. The high margin customers, on the other hand, are often people that not only saw the value paid our price, but they're probably better on our people. If they're better on our people, we're probably putting less cost against it. So it's one place to look. Um, The place not to look, if I can answer it that way. I love that. Is in your CRM system. You know, this controversy that I've started here, I'm actually increasing this controversy, but I think the CRM systems are making us stupid. And the way they're making us stupid is we're putting data uh, non-emotional, non-qualified data into a CRM system. So you see a customer's name and you see a price and you see you know some other uh, maturations as they're moving through the pipeline. And it doesn't give us what we need to understand who is that customer? What kind of relationship do we have with them at the very beginning? Is this a customer that's ultimately going to build our business or not? That's one area of stupidity because we see them coming through and we homogenize the group. We put them all into one category. We homogenize them. We have to stop doing that if we really want to build the high value customer. Second stupidity piece is we put numbers next to their names. And we really believe that we have some massive pipeline. And back to your point, if we're dropping 5% out the bottom, we don't have a massive pipeline. We just have a bunch of waste that we're following through the process. And we're pouring more at the top. And how do we grow it when we use a CRM system like that? We have low value customers is we just put more in the top hoping that X percent is going to come out the bottom. And that's just think about it's more activity, more cost, more resources, more waste uh, in in essence. So anyway, so I had to throw that in just because it's my new controversy. I've had a number of people take me on now with this one, mostly uh, because I, you know, there's two places that we have controversy. That's one. And the other is, is college professors. Uh, That's the whole other, all other topic, but anyway. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's a whole other podcast Let's episode. Throw those in there for the podcast uh, today, shall we? <laughs> That's so fun. Well, you know, and and I would agree with you. I don't think that it means we should throw the baby out with the bathwater and get rid of CRM systems, but I think that the consciousness of what we use that data for and how we use it and what we pair it with, I think is hugely valuable and definitely has me thinking a bit differently about the way we look at our data. You know, it's interesting too because we have we always recommend for our clients to have what we call assessment criteria. When they get an RFP on their desk, they walk through this criteria that's pre-built that is, you know, some of it is very tactical and logistical and some of it is some of the more 
squishy, if you will, formal term squishy. <laughs> and things like, you know, is this the type of a client that you that you really want to work with? Is this the type of a client that gets you excited? And we strongly encourage our clients when they're assessing an RFP to be looking at that kind of stuff instead of just, you know, are we going to hit a certain margin in this? Are we going to, can we meet the terms and conditions? Do we have the staff to do it? All that tactical stuff that I think most people really focus on. So well stated and better stated probably than I think all that data is good for us. It's just how we use it. It's, it's the, how does it inform our decisions? Maybe a better way to look at it. Yeah. This is just the outcome of it. And if it's informing, you know, a set of assumptions that are false, we should go take a hard look at it. So yeah, if you want to go try to take your current pattern of customers and put some qualifiers against it and see if there's a, a binary pattern of those that are really helping you grow your business and those that aren't, I think you'd find some very, very interesting patterns in in the customer relationships that you have. Yeah, I think so too. And I, you know, it's funny because We always talk about this when we've got a client that's really hard to close, you know, they're just hard. And, you know, every time I have that little gut feeling that this is probably not the best client for us, if it's this hard now, how, and I, and when I say hard, I don't mean that they ask for things that they should be absolutely able to ask for, but it's, you know, if they're constantly making you jump through hoops, if they're being difficult in a lot of different ways, they're just that's going to carry through to the client engagement. So I think we can generally tell that early on. So tell me this, what's something that you hear companies and team members say that is an immediate red flag that they have not identified their high value targets appropriately? Yeah, number one is when we, we again, we, we are racing to get a deal done. It could be an RFP or whatever deal that we're working on. There's a, quite a bit of discounting going on or something that we have to get back to the customer that takes us out of our core, that takes us out of our our secret sauce or whatever made us different, whatever made us stand out in the process, we've now changed that. And we did it because under the auspice of, you know, Charles, it's such a great deal or there's so much revenue or whatever. And let me tell you what we found in our four, you know, we had a four-year ethnographic study. We studied companies like yours under the hood for four full years. And what we watched is the is how hard those projects were after you won them. They literally were a bit of a tether to the business. They would, it was just, it was just, it changed the culture in some cases for some companies because they were big wins, lots of potential revenue, low margins, turnover, try hard to find people to come in and do the work. Why did we do all of that? I mean, it's the question I ask because there's plenty of opportunity in the marketplace today. I look at the flood of the two big federal uh, bills that we have across the country today that will supplement at the state level and the county level, of course. There's a lot of work to be won and done out there. So pick the ones that will build your business. So the red flags are when we literally, we convince ourselves, we rationalize why we're doing certain things. And almost all of the convincing and rationalization has to do with some level of revenue coming in the company. And we even discount margin. We discount potentially net income. We do all these things because we think that's the right thing to do to build the business. And by the way, if I can play that out for a minute, one of the best ways to compete, if you have a head to have competitor is let them win those deals. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I think uh, some Great of the point. best businesses we've seen in the service space that you support is they lost a deal and they felt horrible about it. They're like, oh, we put so much time in this. This was a six-month effort. We put our A players on this. We proposed it. We lost it. Now, these are businesses that end up doing pretty well. And I looked at their competition that won the deal and it buried them. It literally buried wow. that business. It, I mean, it's... So sometimes, you know, Garth Brooks has this song called Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. <laughs> I don't want you to pray. But I want you to be more predictive on what you're doing. But Pick the businesses that are going to build your business. Pick the businesses that fit your reason to exist and and you'll do well. It's such a simple concept, right? Pick the businesses that build your business, not that deplete your business. And if we all think that way, I think that there will be a lot more thoughtfulness around the type of clients that we go after. Okay, Charles, so we're going to go into rapid fire, some rapid fire okay. questions as we oh, as boy. we come to a close here. If you could spend five minutes with any company's leadership, who would it be? You mean role-wise, the role and title or the per- what kind of person? I think the, um, the company. What company, if you could sit down with their leadership, what company would it be? So 
I have a really, is it okay if I give you an obscure answer to that? Yes. Okay. So I think you knew this, but I grew up in the state of Montana and there's still less than a million people that live in the third largest, you know, land mass in the contiguous United States. We had this famous person when I was growing up, his name was Evil Knievel. Oh, yeah. now, Evil Knievel was a, a daredevil motorcycle person that was, you know, he jumped motorcycles. I guess he broke every bone in his body three or four times. And, you know, it's one of those questions like, who would you have dinner with if, you know, you could kind of thing. But I was reading this thing about him the other day, and he really wasn't a great, let's just say human on the earth, but he was, he actually was quite a business person. And so, you know, closer to his death, because he he died, unfortunately, of, uh, you know, some complications of all of his injuries, I think. People are saying, well, are you, you know, are you a, a business person? What are you? How would you describe yourself? And he says, I'm, I'm none of those things. I'm an explorer. And and he was constantly trying to explore, you know, how far certain some things would go, what it was like to jump over the Grand Canyon or the Snake River, you know, Canyon, all those kinds of things. And I think what I would, what I really like about entrepreneurs or people building businesses, Lisa, is they're they have a lot of courage and they're explorers. And I think that's who I'd like to be with with a bunch of those people, at least to have a conversation with them. Yeah, that would be fascinating. Things I did not know about Evil Knievel. So thanks for sharing that. <laughs> What's the last book you don't want to know? Right, right. What's the last book you read and what was your biggest takeaway? There's a lot of great books out right now, believe it or not, for what we're doing. But I think the one that I've referred to recently in the library of books I have, it's called The Art of Possibility. It fits you and your team and your, your companies quite a bit. I don't know if you've read it or not, but Ben Zander, he's an older gentleman person now, <laughs> Yeah, more so than the 40 years that I have. He was the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic. He, I think he was the conductor for the better part of 30 years. His wife, uh, Rosamond, is a, uh, somebody who really, uh, she's a scientist that actually studies the human condition. And it's such a great book around what we talk about each day and how do we kind of keep ourselves, our heads in the game. We win some days and we lose some days as business builders. And I think it fits well with you and your audience, but it's... Uh, it's, it's a good book. I just, I just refer to it every once in a while. It's got some big nuggets in it. I One of the it. greatest parts, of course, is that, you know, he's, he thinks we've, we've killed ourselves by only looking for people that get A's on tests and his best talent. And it, Boston, the Boston Philharmonic was one of the best uh, in the country. I, I think it probably still is, are mostly filled with people with, that, are, that are much more ambitious than they are test takers. And he's got a really interesting thing that he goes through it. And entrepreneurs are the same. Well, I would love that because I did not always get good grades. I struggled with test taking, even though I knew the materials, but it was just, it was boring to me. I, I, that's not the way that I like to learn. And yeah, that's, uh, that's his point. Know. Exactly. Some of yeah. the, some of the most talented people he's ever run across didn't work well in these construction, these, these constructed, you know, conditions like a classroom. Yeah. Um, that's why they became artists. So mm, the art of the possibility is really a cool book. Well, it's going on my list. I love it. I love it. Okay. So uh, 20 years from now, what does True Space look like? Well, I, I co-founded True Space with my daughter, Jamie. I have three wonderful children. She's the middle. She's coming up on her fourth decade now, and she's she's really doing great job. We want to ultimately use our research to be a voice in the nation for companies between one and 10 million. There is no voice for them today. So we'd like to inform lawmaking, economic developments, fundraising, all those things with the data that we have. So that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, not sure I'm going to be, you know, at the helm of this thing in 20 years. I, if I'm alive in 20 years, you know, I'm a cancer survivor. So every day for me is a gift, but 20 years, I'd love to have another podcast with you. Let's do it. And, How fun uh, would that be? What does it look like? Retirement. Right? Yeah. Right? Entrepreneurial retirement, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. If there is such a thing, do we ever really ever retire is the question. Oh, you're, you, be, you should be prepared for not being able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, this has been so fantastic, Charles. So if people want to get in touch with you, connect with you or get in touch with your company, how can they do that? Directly. I'm, I'm easily accessible. My email is cfred, cfred at truespace. Truespace is one word, dot com or through you, through our work together. My book is called The 24-Hour Rule, my more recent one. I did a bestseller back in 2002 that's not as relevant as it is uh, this other one today. So you can find that. You can find us online at truespace.com. I hope to hear from a few people. It would be fun to keep this conversation going. 
Yeah. And I encourage you all to reach out to him for sure. We'll have all of that information in the show notes. So Charles, thank you so much uh, from the bottom of my heart for being here. Yeah. Great conversation. Great conversation. All right, everybody, if you like what you hear, we'd love it if you shared our podcast with others who you know would benefit from this information. And on behalf of myself and Charles, I want to thank you for listening to the RFP Success Show. This has been another episode of the RFP Success Show with Lisa Rehurik, eight-time author, speaker, and CEO of the RFP Success Company. Thank you for joining us. If you have feedback on today's episode, email us at podcast at rfpsuccess.com. No matter your business size, industry, if you have an in-house RFP team or need outside support, the RFP Success Company helps increase RFP win ratios by 10, 20, and even 50%. Learn more at the rfpsuccesscompany.com. Come on.